Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. So we're going to do something fun today on the podcast. We are going to report on, wait for it, wait for it, listeners, (laughs) good news. That's right. (laughs) We searched... High and low to try to find some good news about housing to share with all of you. And in some cases, we probably actually maybe took some stuff that maybe was marginally good news and made it into good news just so we could have some good news points. But look, these are some things that I think once you hear all these uh, points that maybe you'll agree things aren't necessarily as bad as they could otherwise be. That's my closest attempt to coming up with good news. Yeah, well, we've had to search far and wide to get some good stuff going here. And, you know, I have to say that a lot of it is coming right from our own coaching clients. So that makes me proud and happy and, you know, uh, very much encouraged. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so listeners, um, remember, if you've not yet downloaded your Ultimate Agent Survival Guide, it is there waiting for you on the free coaching program. And to get access to the information, all you have to do is text the word SURVIVAL to 31996. That is our three-part Ultimate Agent Survival Guide. It takes you through all of the the salient points and programs that you need to be uh, signing yourself up for immediately. There's obviously a litany of new government programs that are coming out, and Julie and I are frankly going above and beyond, maybe even losing too much sleep, trying to make sure we get you guys the best information. We know a lot of you are hearing, and you know, anytime I get an email or a text from one of you saying, Tim, I'm hearing that, I automatically know that you haven't done any research and you're just asking me a question that's half baked. But that's okay. Um, Chances are, if you're not getting correct information, you're passing uh, passing along the bad information to other people, which means you're becoming part of the problem, not part of the solution. Indeed. Uh, And we're talking about mortgage forbearances. We're talking the PPP. We're talking about stuff like that. So here's what I want you guys to remember. All you've got to do is log into the free coaching site after you've texted the word survival to 31996 and download the latest information. And what we have take, what we are doing personally, and we have two people on staff that are doing this as well, is we're constantly keeping this information up, um, up to date. And one of the things that we're gonna tell you about, actually it's the first point, is the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, getting refunded. Um, well, we told you guys when that program came out that we did not think it would last until its you know, end of June grandfather date. That's how yeah. long that program was supposed to last. We knew it was going to go right away, and we also told you guys that they're going to make the, comp- the, uh, the program more complicated, more you know, paperwork-laden. Well, all those things seem to be happening, um, but I don't want to step on Julie's first point. So the main thing is, is if you guys have bad information, here's what you're going to create. You're going to create hundreds, if not thousands of people that have bad information. On um, yesterday's podcast, we talked to you guys about the uh, increase that no one's talking about, by the way, in defaults, and I'm not going to tell this is this is... This show is good news, so I'm not going to talk about that. If you want to listen about that, just listen to the Sunday special show that we did. But there's an increase in defaults that, frankly, is, I don't think, that surprising, but a lot of people weren't predicting. And some of you guys are saying, how could there be defaults when there's um, forbearances and things of that nature? Well, the simple answer is, is because people, consumers, you guys, who have gone to the internet, Facebook and whatnot, and heard that the forbearance programs are this, that, and the other thing, you are essentially passing along bad information and to the point where you're frustrating people, probably yourselves, and you're not even trying. We told you on yesterday's show how you can very specifically force your lender to give you a 12-month forbearance. So please be very careful what you're saying, what you're believing, and who you're listening to because there's an excellent chance that you're not going to get the correct information and then you're then going to pass the incorrect information off to other people and you're going to be part of the problem, not part of the solution, right? So listen to yesterday's show. Anything you want to tag on that before we get to our first um, well, mostly yes. good point? I mean, there, there are instances where you're going to have to be responsible and accountable for bringing your lender the information that they should be following. That just means that there are ill-informed servicers answering the phone and you've got to do your part to cover yourself. And I'm sorry about that, but that is the world that we're living in, in some cases. In other cases, it's spick and span, done five-minute phone call and it's over with. So um, 
you know, there you have it. But don't not pursue it. And to Tim's point, don't believe reporting from sources that may or may not be correct. You've got to do your own research. That's what we try to bring you all the time is accurate actual information. So as Tim said, the payroll protection plan known as the PPP is about to be refunded with more money on the way with another 300 billion plus. That's B as in boy or a billion. That's a lot of money. But last go around, even though they left it open for two and a half months, the money was gone in only 10 days. So don't wait. All right, uh, let's move on to some more good news. I've been on the phone literally the entire day with our elite coaching clients, our one-on-one Uh, members talking about what is happening in their businesses. So I would say, by and large, life continues on. Deals are absolutely closing. One of my coaching clients north of Atlanta took eight listings, eight new listings in one week's time. Who are these people that want to list? Well, they're people who are doing normal things for normal reasons, upsizing, downsizing, moving in town, out of town. And in addition to that, her phone has been on fire with people looking for rural or semi-rural properties so they could get out of their neighborhoods, get out of their buildings and get some privacy. I thought that was very interesting. Then she's gonna, she's set up to have one of her best quarters ever. So that's definitely a bright light and she's not the only one. Well, but that goes- I just thought it was very interesting though. But that goes, that that plays into the very obvious fact that so many other agents are not being very responsive. They're not answering their phones. They're not knowing what to do. They're spending too much time on Netflix. And uh, she's doing the exact opposite. She's being the contrarian. She's making money right now. She's making a lot Mm -hmm. of money. She's maybe even making her unfair share of money because of the fact Mm -hmm. that she's willing to go after the listings and she's learned how to get price reductions and price accordingly. You did. We actually talked about she was having a little bit of guilt for having so much (laughs) success right now, which is so counterintuitive, right? But you can totally feel where she would be coming from on that. And so we talked a little bit about the uh, taking, takings clause in the Fifth Amendment and how this is a constitutional well, issue. Well, things, right? Well, but, but my point is, related to that, you take what the market is willing to give you, and she's there to help people. And part of her job has become similar to our job with coaching people, that it's okay to take things like the PPP, because some of her clients are business owners who are having to shift and sort. So... Anyway, that's that's what that was. So about. the moral but, of the story it, is, is, it's okay to do well in these times. Feel guilty when you're doing well and other people aren't. It's just the fact. The reason that's happening is because people are choosing her to do business with, and they're not choosing her competitors because her competitors aren't standing in the gap trying to make these people's lives better. They that's right. She is that's offering. That's where I was going with that. She, she's offering. That's all right. You were meandering. It was a long country road, but you know what? She's we, providing service. In we the same all for, way. we all forgive you, Julie, because we know you've been on coaching calls all day. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. at least they've been good. <laughs> yes. So next good news. <laughs> next good news. Uh, well, so that good news was deals are closing. You, I do see people having to be much more flexible with how they're putting deals together, with being sensitive to different lending standards and practices. One of the good news that I have uh, uncovered through researching the mortgage changes are things like, you know, we were reporting that Chase has tightened up to 700 credit score and 20% down. And there was a lot of reporting on that and other lenders that they really don't want to deal with you unless you deal with their new standards. Okay, fine. Well, in the bottom of a lot of those articles or in related articles, there's things like in the same Chase one, it said, oh, and by the way, we're still doing, I think it was called like our Dream Homes program which only requires a 630 credit score and 3% down, quote, if you qualify, which is probably qualifying for being under a certain amount of income. But these programs still are going on. I reviewed a closing settlement with one of my coaching clients in Baltimore this morning who did a 100% financed VA deal, no down payment, still is getting approved, a little bit of money to closing for taxes and insurance, but that's it. So here's the point. We talked about this a little bit on a couple of previous shows last week. Because of the tightened lending standards, you're going to have to be more sensitive to where you're sending your buyer clients or where the buyer clients are doing business who are in contract on your listings. Not every lender does every type of deal. So if you've got a buyer who got turned down or or a lender saying, well, we can try an FHA deal, take them to somebody who loves doing FHA instead. But specifically, if you guys are hearing about these lender overlays, they do exist. They are happening. The big banks are taking what essentially is the FHFA's 
uh, you know, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, all these, they're taking their, you know, the standard uh, rules that someone has to qualify for using, and then they're putting overlays on top of that. That's what a lender overlay is. And some of these lender overlays, they don't tell you. They don't all of a sudden advertise, oh, guess what? Chase Bank is now harder to get a mortgage at. Right. We've now raised the minimum credit score by 100 points, and we've raised the down payment by this amount. Well, those things are happening, but what you're learning now, or hopefully you're learning if you're listening to us, is that not all lenders play those games. And if you're going to have a borrower who's going to use a government mortgage, basically, then you need to work with a, a mortgage lender who is a approved not a broker for, but an actual mortgage lender for the FHA. And, you know, we talked about in Columbus, Ohio, we used to use Yerky Mortgage because they don't have any of those overlays. This means that the people, the agents that have the skill set, that know the stuff, that have done the work, are going to have an advantage in the marketplace to get deals together. Say, for example, you're a listing agent and you get a con- and you have a you know, a buyer that wants to buy the house, but they think they don't qualify, you know, because whatever, they read something online or were on Facebook and got bad information. And you can then tell them that not only do they most likely qualify, but the down payment that they needed was less than they thought. And you know how to get a deal done that other people can't. This is what gives you an unfair advantage in the marketplace. And that's what you need. If you've done the work, you deserve an unfair advantage in the marketplace. Julie? Thank you. That's a better way of making the point. Yes. Okay, so the next thing that is really being discussed amongst our listeners and our coaching clients is what's going to happen with pricing. So here's a quote for you. With affordable housing in extraordinarily short supply. Now, that's not everywhere. Like New York and Miami, you guys went into this with a buyer's market. But most areas, we still had short supply. House price declines should be limited. And given the tight mortgage underwriting, plain vanilla fixed rate mortgage loans originated since the crisis... Um, so too will be limited foreclosures. So that's from an economist at Moody's. Now, we also bring you the flip side so you can think with your own brains. Here's the thing. What is going to be the impact of fewer jobs, tighter lending requirements, lack of confidence, and overall fear in the market before the vaccine? And that's, a, you know, we can talk about when or if there's a vaccine, but lack of confidence and uncertainty usually means people don't take any action. It's what we've cautioned all of you against. So the flip side to this is what will be the impact of the massive unemployment numbers and the tighter lending standards. We're going to all have to wait and see. But a lot of these economists are making the point that unlike before, you know, if you which you shouldn't really be comparing it to the previous recession, but this housing market was much stronger going in. There was much more demand going into this than there was before, and we still have equity. But is that really true? I think that's I think that's some. Uh... If you look at the building, um, you know how many homes were being built at the peak of the boom pre-recession well, versus now. Vastly less inventory now, which means more demand on that front. Well, but Julie, let's go. Let's hop back in our time machine. Let's sure. go back because I read two articles like that when I was researching yeah. this content for us, and I think I don't. I think they're wrong. I don't remember there being uh, a huge amount of inventory for sale back before the housing bust. That wasn't the case. It was a seller's market. There may have been markets where there's more There was inventory. more than there is now, but there's... But there were, yeah. yeah, but I wonder if that statistically is true. I don't think we'll it is. we have to look it up. And so there's, I've read two articles where basically people were saying it's not like last time because last time that there was tons of inventory for sale and you know now there's no inventory. That's not, I'm well, 99% I'm, sure that's not true. Maybe they mean once we were into the recession, no, they there was don't. more. They're not leading no. up to. Okay. And so I don't think that's true. And if you read these... So, it's, yeah. you, so I think what happens is basically, you, and you see this happening a lot, it happens with... Our listeners is one little bit of information gets essentially lionized as being factual, and then people repeat it right. and repeat There's it. There's a repeat lot it. of that going on, right? right now. And I, but I, uh, well, I would say using our own brains. Listeners, when you, if you were uh, with us, if you were selling real estate prior to the bust in 07, 08, I do you remember there being a bunch of houses for sale? Do you remember it being a buyer's market? Because I don't. I remember it being an incredibly hot seller's market, not so different than the one we just got out of. So correct us if we're wrong on that one. You guys can email us, Tim at Tim at Yeah, but I, I would err on your side with that because logically speaking, if you simply take unemployment numbers plus, you know, more unemployment numbers as businesses fail, you have, you know, the whole mortgage thing tightening up. Those two factors alone in a normal market would cause, you know, more inventory and fewer buyer sides, which ultimately affects price. Other than base housing, right? You just need a place right. to live, right? Other than base housing, can you think of anything that's not sold real estate-wise off pure emotions? 
No, it's always off of emotions. Yeah. I mean, people don't... And really, guys, you can you know scale that out. There's not a single thing on the face of planet Earth that isn't sold based on emotions. You know that you know that it's intuitive, and you could you could argue. Well, that's well, where there's people whose job is marketing. You know, right. so they can suck you in and but, get but even, excited. But even more than that, like people can say, "Well, Tim, a toilet paper's not sold with emotions." That's not true. Everything's okay. sold with well, emotions. Well, then why is there a fuzzy little teddy bear on the outside of the that's package? That's right, Charmin. Right. So, <laughs> so really, if people aren't feeling confident, is my point. If people, all, this is the counterpunch. This is what you guys need to keep in mind. And you use your own brains to make your own opinions, but these are all our opinions, right? trust me, believe me, we'd love there to be a rubber band snap back in the market and things be back the way they were. But the reality of it is, and this is really the you know counterpunch to all these good news stories, is that until people are feeling confident, ultimately, um, until people have jobs that are paying the same, if not more than that they were getting paid before, you're not going to see a return of not just housing, but anything in the economy. Because if people aren't confident, they're not going to feel comfortable and confident spending money, especially in a luxury item or even an item that's, you know, an an upgrade to a house or a car. They're just not. Now, will there be a bounce back? Will there be some sort of, you know, natural, you know, for for Frugality fatigue. Thank you. Nice segue into our next point, by the way. Yes, you're welcome. So frugality fatigue. There are droves of cooped up Americans who, quote, have clear plans to eat out, drink, exercise, and buy clothes, but not travel for a while. Even after the COVID-19 restrictions lift uh, in this, you know, reporting that we researched for you guys. So, quote, close to 60% will return to discretionary stores within two weeks of lifting of quarantine restrictions. 30% reported, that's pretty low, 30% reported bars and restaurants as their priority, 28% gyms and only 22% clothing or accessory stores. So how will businesses stay in business after being closed up for long if only these low percentages of people plan on getting back there anytime soon? How many people who are unemployed will rush back to work? How many people will feel well, no, comfortable? No, no. These are the counter punches, right? Yeah. So the point was, is people are saying the article was... The They're going to go shop. The gist of it was, is people are going to you know, want to get outside and go shop and have fun and all the rest of it. And then the I'm, I was balancing it with what Julie was just yeah. reading. So you can go ahead and finish reading those points. Yes. Well, so that may be true. And even, even so, those percentages are fairly low. So you've got to ask yourself, flip side... How will businesses stay in business when they've been closed for so long? And if there is a long haul to get people back even interested in, say, going to the gym or to a clothing store, retail has been in the news uh, for the past couple of days, wanting more support from the government. How many people who are unemployed are going to just rush back to work? Well, no place to rush back to. How many people will be comfortable spending money when there's no vaccine and we have uncertainty, legitimate fears of uh, forcing everybody back into lockdown? We talked about yesterday the, the W-shaped spiking where things will be fine for a while, then maybe we're going to have an outbreak and we're all locked up again. I was listening to uh, Peter Schiff's podcast yesterday, and I told you about this, Julie. You didn't listen to this one with, the, with me, did know. you? Tell me. He was talking about the PPP, and he was talking about um, essentially what yeah. actual effect his, theor- his thesis was, and he kind of made it a point that I couldn't poke holes in when I was listening, was that the PPP is going to cause more businesses to fail than actually, you know, that you would ever ever even remotely consider and the reason why is because he was his theory was like and he was using a restaurant as an example so if you have a restaurant that's you know grossing five hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever it is a million dollars a year it doesn't really matter you're probably as the owner you're only making maybe five percent statistically that's what it actually is restaurants are massive money losers and you guys would be surprised if you've ever uh, researched how little margin most businesses make real estate brokerages are some of the worst uh, margin businesses that you'll ever come across two or three percent in normal cases of the of the net and not of the gross revenue guys don't get confused but on the commission so like house sells for 100 grand the commission is six grand you know and three thousand goes to the you know listing broker well then the listing broker is going to make you know maybe three percent of that it's shockingly small really businesses that are essentially not even they're basically non-profits most of them that's the reason that most broker owners sell just to keep the lights on. Their own production subsidizes their unproductive agents. That's the unfortunate part. Um, which, by the way, is one of the biggest reasons so many agents and brokers are flocking to EXP Realty. If EXP Realty is on your radar, or even if it's not, and you guys want to have a private one-on-one con- uh, consultation, coaching call with me, feel free to text me, 
0206. In my opinion, EXP Realty is the, is the biggest no-brainer business decision you'll ever you know, be blessed to have to make. And you should seriously consider looking into it now because the, the masses of agents and brokerages that are flocking to EXP because the model was literally built for a market like this. That's what was kind of shocking as you go through it and you look at it. It's amazing. But yeah, text me if you want to talk about it, 512-758-0206. So Peter's thesis was, let's say you're that restaurant owner and let's say you get bailed out and you're given like $150,000 um, and that money's supposed to be used to keep your, you know, basically keep your staff employed. Well, he was saying, what makes you think the staff's even going to want to come back to work because of the fact that they're on unemployment getting money essentially for not working. And the unemployment benefits right now for the average Joe and Josephine in many of these cases is going to be the same, if not in some cases more than they would have made if they were working, as crazy as that is to sound. So the reality of it is, is a lot of these workers won't want to come back to work and they could simply use the excuse that they're worried about getting the virus and that will still keep them qualified for unemployment. And so his theory, and again, I think it's a good one, for restaurants and similar businesses, they're not going to have the ability to generate enough revenue to keep the business open, even with the loan. And so the loan's going to go unpaid. And the loan itself will then go, it'll go into default. And the company will declare bankruptcy. So what Peter was suggesting is that we look forward 6, 12, 18 months, you're going to start seeing a lot of small businesses that were marginal to begin with who took the PPP money are going to declare bankruptcy. The businesses will go out of, uh, of business and maybe they'll come back as something else or, you know, a lot of business owners never shake the entrepreneurial itch. So maybe they'll come up with a better idea next. doesn't matter. It is the nature of life. But in this particular case, what's going to happen is that the businesses will fail the, and there's no recourse on these loans. The PPP loans have no recourse. They don't go after any of your personal assets. And assuming you didn't uh, commit fraud with the loan, and it's it, the, frankly, the terms of the loan are pretty amazing, uh, there's no repayment on it anyway. If you use 75% of it for payroll, even if it was your own, well, here's the thought. You, you're not allowed to pay anybody with a PPP more than $100,000. Well, let's say, for example, you decide to hire your wife to work at your restaurant. Well, she's making $100,000. You're going to decide to hire your 16-year-old kid. He's making $100,000, right? And there's no rule saying you can't do that. Now you've used 75% of whatever your PPP loan was, and you are now well within the, you know, the qualifications of not having to pay it back, and it turns into a grant. That's kind of an interesting perspective, and I think it's probably true. It'll, the PPP, which was meant to be a lifeline for small businesses, might actually turn out to be an anchor, which is kind of fascinating to consider that. So, Unintended consequences. Un well, but isn't that the rule? It's like yeah. student loans, you know? I know. It's crazy. I mean, <laughs> you know, we talk about that on this yeah. podcast. But so in any event, um, by the way, the PPP money <laughs> just along <laughs> because, you know, you should be grabbing it as a broker and agent. They are going to do we get to that point yet? It's coming up, right? Yes. Okay. I don't want to step on Julie's next That's point. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, we, we, so let's talk about this whole discussion about housing crash, yay or nay. Um, you know, the financial press is pushing housing crash 2.0, which of course gets tons of clicks. But the reality is it would take far deeper recession than the financial crisis to see similar effects. This is the potential positive, then we'll give you the counterpunch. Uh, to see similar effects on the using U.S. housing markets, which entered the current crisis on stable footing amid, amid lingering undersupply of housing in a decade of deleveraging, a vastly different fundamental environment than the pre-crisis period. Subprime and variable rate mortgages, which were at the root in the cascade of foreclosures that sparked the financial crisis, have been almost non-existent over the last decade. Quote, super prime, which is a score of 760 plus, was uh, credit score, accounted for more than 50% of all originations from 2010 to 2019. And that share has steadily risen more than 60% to more than 60% in 2019, where the average mortgage debt service payment ratio as a percent of disposable income was the lowest level on record at 4.12%. By comparison, this level was at 7% at the time the job growth turned negative in Q1 of 2008. Now, this is a whole lot of trying to make this time not really like that time, and because we don't have uh, subprime that we must be okay. But the flip side is, back then, the, the story wasn't, yes, there was an unemployment, but if you look at that chart, it doesn't even register compared to what unemployment is now. Um, so flip side, unemployment, higher lending standards, add this to the proven behavioral patterns, making payments, and when the bank becomes your landlord, so you're upside down, people stop paying. And you have no equity. So the next big story to watch will be the number of renters not paying rent 
landlords who own multiple units having to face issues, and luxury rental complexes who lose tenants to lower priced units that pe where people don't have jobs. So I would add to that, Tim, also the VRBO market that has virtually no income right now. Not everybody can keep that, especially if they have mortgages on those and HOA dues. Not everybody's going to sustain that when they're having absolutely zero income, especially if the property was purchased specifically to be a vacation rental. So that plus unemployment, tighter lending standards, and we'll see whether the flip side is right. But that's the variable to all these points, guys. All these good news stories. I wish, and I looked, I, I swear to you listeners, I swear, I looked I swear. for a story that was saying, was passing along good news that took into consideration the other, you know, the other factors that are making this uh, recession probably into something far greater. And the number one thing is employment. And is there going to be a snapback of employment? I don't see how. And matter of fact, some of these government programs are going to give people permission to take four months off and maybe longer because it's an election year. And then people are going to be on unemployment for long periods of time. And then they're going to have to unring that bell. How are they going to do that? And there's this Main Street lending program that I understand is also now going to be coming out where the minimum loan amount is going to be a million dollars. Doesn't the Main Street lending program have some of the same downside ramifications as the PPP? Well, we're going to find out when more details are finally released. So look, bottom line, we are in a new era, a totally, completely different economy where most, if not all the rules have changed or will be in, in flux until basically things calm down. So our big, our essentially overriding thesis with all these, you know, people that want to have a happy talk about housing and the economy on a whole is how can there be, and believe me, I'd love to be on that side of the fence too, it's easier, but how can there be any kind of return to anything that even remotely resembles normalcy until people have jobs again, until people are able to borrow money again, until people feel confident again. So when, do, when does all that happen? How does that, and listeners, how does that happen pre-vaccine? I don't get it. I don't really think it's going to happen. Well, just the massive uncertainty about pretty much everything causes people to, you know, want to stay at home and do nothing. Some of you guys are like that. That's why we've been so hard on you to get and, into and action. Frank, and frankly, that's the reason some of our coaching clients are cleaning up because you guys are basically walling yourselves in, watching too much Netflix, and you're not realizing there's always going to be yes. sellers that have to sell. And you guys are wasting time. You're going to let this whole year get by you. And the problem is, is you're going to dig yourself into a financial hole that you're not ever going to be able to get out. This is the reason that Julie and I have been doing everything in our power to get you guys prepared for this changing, shifting market. It's not too late for you. We're only basically a month into this. So you can still turn things around, but you've got to realize that you got to stop waiting. No one's really going to bail you out except yourself. Nobody ever really does bail you out except yourself. You ever notice that? Next point, Jules. Oh, that's it. The last point was similar to what you said earlier. So do you want to do things I like and things I hate, or do you want to save that for tomorrow? Oh, I can tell you've got some things on your mind. Well, just a couple of minor things. Okay. So let's do things I hate first. I just sort of touched on that is the uncertainty of all this in so many segments, the uncertainty of when the vaccine's going to come, uncertainty of which way the housing market's going to, to flip, the uncertainty of how much unemployment we're going to have, the uncertainty that lenders are, are laying upon all of you guys and making it harder for you to apply and have to do your own research. I hate that. And I, I pray every night that this turns around and gets easier and more streamlined and that we have more answers. But in the meantime, you have to take what the market is willing to give you. You have to say, yes, it would be my pleasure to help you with that and make sure you're taking care of yourself first. So that's, that's my thing I hate, which is uncertainty right now. Things I like on a lighter note, you know, I have a lot of calls with various people all the time. So yesterday, maybe the day before I was uh, talking with my uh, T-Mobile service guy setting up iPads for your mom and our kid. And Zoe was, of course, coming unglued after a long day of homeschool and having to be good while we're on the phone, things of that nature. And she was kind of screaming in the background, wanting something, kind of whining. And, and I said to her, Zoe, whining doesn't fix your iPad. I already tried that. And so he starts cracking up. And then she starts whining more. And he said, how is it that my kids are at your house? It sounds exactly like what's going on in my house. And then he goes on to tell me, so things I like are homeschool hacks. That's a new category. Mm -hmm. So I said, so how do you keep him out of your hair? Because he's working. He was fielding my T-Mobile call from his house as well. And he said, here's what I do. Every day I have a new treasure hunt. I take some of their favorite things, their favorite toys from their rooms, and I create a treasure hunt in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And I give them hints. Like I don't tell them exactly what they're looking for, but I give them hints like it's fuzzy and you really like to snuggle it. 
and it's somewhere in the backyard. It could be up a tree, it could be behind a rock, keeps them busy for hours. So I thought that was pretty entertaining. And then we're doing a lot of exchanging of uh, different apps to keep the little boogers busy. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm kind of enjoying the homeschool hacks. That's my things I like. Um, I'll tell, I'm going to start with the thing I like. The thing I like is I see the same thing we saw back in 07, 08. We're starting to see an emergence of people with skill set take command of their markets. We're starting to see essentially... You know, guys, when you're in real estate and you go to a real estate market and you're trying to get market share, you just want to take a listing. You just want to get some sales in that market. But there's well entrenched, you know, dominant, maybe two or three agents. It's really tough to get something out of that out of that market. But what happens in a market like this is that those people don't necessarily know what to do. And then they fumble. They wait too long. And you can go in there and snatch up their expired listings, which is always the best and easiest way to get a foothold in the marketplace is just call expired listings. And then from that, you can build your business into something that you could have never done had it stayed a seller's market. So I love that. I love the fact that this is a... This is a firmly a skills-based market now, and the agents who aren't complacent will win. You can actually win right now with brute force and uh, taking control of what you know and how you can the levels of which you can help people. Okay, things I hate. Oh, I always say the same thing because I don't hate very many things. Truthfully, no, it's just harder to come up with things we hate. That's well, true. but the things I hate, I hate listening to other people give you guys advice, and they're oh, saying the yeah. same crap that they were, and they're so wrong. And they're so wrong. I'm so tired of everyone just telling you guys to lean on your centers of influence and past clients right now. I'm so sick of people essentially telling you that you can social network your way through this. None of these things have ever made sense and they don't make sense now. Don't you guys understand? I'm I'm getting my ranty voice going, aren't I? But don't you guys... But don't you guys understand that the only reason those things were uh, looked like they were working before is because the market was essentially selling itself in this past That's market? That's so true. Don't you guys get that? You think that the goofiness that you were, you were only doing most of the things you were doing, you know, from, uh, you know, social networking and all the rest of it, branding, you were only doing that because you thought you were supposed to. No one ever stopped to explain to you what the business model is or how you can actually quantify whether those things make sense. You guys understand? So the reality of it is, is that those programs never made sense. Those things never worked. And because everything was selling itself and because everyone else was doing it, you thought that's what you were supposed to do too. And now here we are at the end of this cycle where those ideas are clearly failed. They're always failing. Now they're failed ideas. And yet those same people, because they don't know what else to tell you, are out there, out there telling you to do the same exact thing. So I hate that. And I hate that especially because I know for a fact that a lot of our quote unquote competitors listen to our podcast. I know it for a fact because they tell me. And they thank us. And they oftentimes ask questions. They ask permission to use different things that we're saying, which I always agree to. If you ask, you can use some of Julie and I's content. I want to help other agents, right? Makes perfect sense to me to help, you know, essentially even people that might be perceived as our competitors disseminate information that's more valuable. But what I'm seeing is those of you who are listening, who are in positions of leadership, and you then don't pass along that information, Why aren't you doing that? The only reason you're not doing that is because you are just trying to basically load your own ship up first. And we read stories to you guys last week, one email in particular, where this gal was talking about the fact that, you know, we had warned all of you, we continue to warn all of you guys, that uh, there are brokerages out there that are essentially looking for their exit plan. There are brokers right now that are giving you guys happy talk all the while they're going to fail. And the problem is, is when they fail and you have any pendings or listings with them, any money whatsoever tied up with them, there's an excellent chance, it's depending on your state, and I'm not an attorney or an accountant, but this is what we were told, it gets wrapped into your, um, it gets wrapped into their bankruptcy and you can't get your money. And so you, how do you know whether your broker is going to stay open or they're going to fail? Do you know their numbers? Well, I just told you the, the statistical facts is most brokers have already ran through their savings. Most brokers had a month or two months worth of savings. And if, if they don't have any closings, where are they getting that money? How are they keeping the lights on? How are they paying, paying the errors and emissions insurance? And how are they paying for all those fixed costs that are still there even though you're not allowed to go to the office? You guys thought about this? They're not, or they are, but they're not going to be doing it for much longer, and they're not going to be able to afford to. Now, brokers, you have to do the honorable thing 
and essentially look for a graceful exit to something that's better. That's the reason, one of the biggest reasons Julian and I are such advocates of VXP Realty. And if you want to talk to me about that, just text me at 512-758-0206. But in the meantime, agents, you got to protect yourselves. you got to open your eyes. So the other thing I hate is people that know better and they still don't tell the truth. That's the biggest yeah. thing that I hate. Yeah, well, that's that's an ego issue, isn't it? With them or with me? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they, both. That they know better, but they're not doing anything about it. You know, because they're protecting themselves first, you know. So yeah, anyway, I, I agree with you with your things that you hate. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, some of those persist, but I'll continue to look for things that I like. I've got another list for tomorrow from coaching clients. So Good. some of these are pretty funny. I will tell you, I've, I have, I guess I would say I've reheard because I did hear this from somebody very similar in uh, Las Vegas during the 2008 times that uh, some of our clients are picking up listings because these are people they didn't know before. And the reporting is, I called my agent and they said it was a bad time to sell, but I have to sell. So can you help me? <laughs> you know, like who says that? I had another report of the agent said, well, we're not allowed to go outside. So I can't, I can't list your property. Uh, well, how about we figure out a different way to take care of business people? So it, it shouldn't be about your first reaction. Remember, you're supposed to be working with people who have to sell. If they have to sell, you have to help them. It's pretty clear. So I just got an email. We were just about to wrap. This yep. is kind of funny. So I just got this from uh, Inman, right? Our mm -hmm. afternoon email, you know. And his first article is, Howard Hanna's president predicts a slow V-shaped recovery. So... What does that mean? What is a slow V-shaped recovery? Would that the be... definition of a V-shape was a quick, dramatic recovery? There is no slow V-shaped recovery. Would that be a U or as we were are saying, a recession or a depression? Here, I'm going to I'm going to read you these other headlines. Ready, Julie? Sure. Create a brand that brings your dream clients. Ugh. Okay. No, no, it, it gets better. You ready? Yeah. Market snapshot: Florida and the. Uh, Coronavirus pandemic. All right, that might be interesting, actually. Oh, here. How about this next title? This is what's happening to Inman, by the way. Mm -hmm. Sex for rent. Requests from landlords soar amid pandemic. Women advocacy groups in Hawaii and Illinois say renters are being pressured to perform sexual acts what? in lieu of rent as unemployment rises. That's a story, according to Inman. Wow, that is really reaching. Isn't that terrible? Realtor.com oh, extends agent billing relief. What are the common elements you guys are seeing with all these stories? Don't be a stealth agent during the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm sure it's about centers of influence of past clients. Uh, as you go through all these headlines, what's the recurring thing? They're not telling you the heavy lifting stuff. They're not telling you the facts. They're, They're not trying to keep you entertained, basically. Right. They're not telling you what you don't want to hear when you don't want to hear at the highest level. We are. Stay tuned. Stay close. If there's ever anything we can do for you guys, you know how to reach out to us. You guys have a fantastic day. And remember, thank you for continuing to make this the number one listen to daily podcast for agents in the nation. Uh, we are always amazingly touched by how many of you guys listen and how many of you share the podcast. Please continue to do so. You can listen to us anytime at iTunes, Stitcher, or hop over to our main website, timandjulieharris.com. Have a fantastic day, and we'll see you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs>